All right, so um, my name is Oleg, and uh, I came here from Helsinki, from Finland, to speak at the conference here, and um, my topic is relocation from A to Z. I spent probably half of my life abroad. I always wanted to travel, and today I'm here to share this experience, and uh, I would like to actually focus more on the pain points when you decide to, to relocate. But game industry, as we all know, is probably the most entertaining and the most international one. So thank you very much for coming, and I hope that it's going to be interesting for you. <coughs> I want to tell you a little bit about our, us. Uh, we're Games Factory Talents. And um, oh, sorry, I, I'm going to start with the agenda. So I will tell a little bit about us. I will say a few words about myself, my experience of working and living in a few countries. Um, and most importantly for you, I see a lot of young people here today. Um, I will give my understanding or survival kit for those people who decide to relocate or want to go abroad for the first time because that's the most interesting and the most difficult experience. Um, we are at the business conference, so I think it's important that uh, we cover the business cultures, uh, certain aspects of working, um, especially abroad. And um, I will tell you a little bit how I, today, from the experience of working and, and living abroad, how I decide the place and, and choose the place to, to live. Um, so a little bit about ourselves. Uh, we are Games Factory Talents. And uh, first of all, uh, we are an, a no-CEO company. I think this is important. We are a small team. Um, we are, most of us are foreigners, actually. We are based at, in Helsinki, uh, and 75% um, of us are foreigners. We're a talent agency, and uh, what we do, we help the talents, guys like you, uh, to find the best place in the game industry, or we try to help you to find the best fit. And um, we're a talented team, uh, small, uh, but we have experience both in recruiting and uh, in the game industry. And most importantly, we are based at the embassy of the Finnish games industry, Games Factory. Uh, this is us, a small team, uh, myself and uh, Mia. We are the founders of the company. We started this business about a year ago, and so far it's been going pretty good. So what we do, uh, we do the um, job fairs. Maybe some of you have been. We've done this, we do the job fairs in Helsinki. We've done St. Petersburg. We visited Kiev. We've done a job fair in Brno. We did one in Tallinn and uh, we very much also want to travel to, to Minsk to organize it there. Uh, uh, we are matchmaking developers and game industry professionals to the best companies in Finland and, and, and Nordics. Uh, and we are taking care of relocation. So if some of you decide to join any of these companies, we're also helping you uh, with all the aspects. Um, and for our customers, we're also doing the outstaffing model where we help them to hire the people for short-term projects to complete the project. Um, a little bit of an advertisement. So actually our next IT and J uh, game shop fair is going to take place in St. Petersburg on the 15th of June at the Ingria Techno Park. I uh, met a lot of people yesterday from St. Petersburg, but if you are not from St. Petersburg, I would like to invite you to join. There will be five companies from Finland mainly, and uh, they are looking for uh, talented developers, designers, and artists from Russia. And um, these events are about actually the interviews, so you get to apply, the companies are going to review your resume, and then the companies are going to do like a face-to-face -face interviews. And uh, the companies are going to come to St. Petersburg. Uh, there's going to be the presentations, so you get to talk to the companies, you get to go through the interviews, and um, hopefully some of you are going to get the job offers, or hopefully many of you. Um, so I, I will tell a little bit um, about myself. I, um, I got two degrees from Finland. I traveled the world, but nevertheless, I spent. it took me a long time to, to, to graduate. So I have both technical and business educations. Um, and my experience lies with uh, Nokia. For seven years, I, I, I spent um, uh, in Nokia. And during that time, I did a lot of traveling. I think most of my time I was traveling 
abroad. It was mainly um, Finland, UK, uh, China, India, Russia, and Ukraine. So this has been the experience of the countries that I lived in. And um, after leaving Nokia, I was a uh, startup entrepreneur. A lot of people dream about that, but it's hard. So it was not a big success. And then after um, the first startup that wasn't really doing that well, I was also a consultant to the Finnish Economic Development Agency, helping to actually develop a soft lending uh, program for the foreign game companies on setting up the operations in Finland. I'm the organizer of the Finnish Game Day. It's an event that takes place one day before the White Nights, traditionally, at the Consulate of Finland in St. Petersburg. And this picture, I was looking for the pictures. This is actually my very first DevGam in Kiev a few years, few years back. Uh, and today, I'm a co-founder of the Games Factory Talents, the talent agency that I told you about. And, um, but I think that right now I would like to tell my experience and hopefully, as said before, it's going to be useful for many of you when you decide to relocate. So I think the most, the, 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 the biggest part is um, whenever you relocate to a new environment, the first thing that you're facing is the culture. Some people say, wh wh what is the culture, right? Like, wh what does it actually mean? It's... Um, some people say it's everything, some people say it's nothing, but at the same time, if you look um, at the cultural uh, definition, so it's values, beliefs, norms, certain rules, how you make the decisions, certain morals, the language, your education, religion at the same time. So I would say it's a lot of things and it's a lot of everything. Once you live in a, in a one country, you get accustomed to a certain things. But once you change the culture, you start to understand that people are just accustomed to the different way of thinking and way of making the decisions. They are not wrong, they are just different. The, uh, and, and my definition, I try to be very simple in terms of how I decide in terms of the culture. So for me, the culture is just the way of life. The way things work, the way f life goes in a certain area, or I would say that uh, rather with a certain people that, that, that are there around you. And then of course, who living abroad? Who doesn't want to go and live abroad? It looks like it's an amazing opportunity. It's an experience that uh, broadens your perspectives, opens new horizons, and um, brings new people like totally with the totally different backgrounds, opens new doors, and uh, you feel like you want to jump on it. You really want to, to, to do that. But what happens actually when y the person moves to a totally new cultural like, environment? And I will tell you, these are this is something that I experienced many times myself, and this is the definition of a cultural shock. You know, you feel whenever you make a decision to move and you are moving, you are feeling this anxiety and you really feeling that, okay, wow, it's going to be great. So that's the period, the honeymoon. You jump on the plane, you come to a new country first, there's some things that you need to find the apartment, you get to know the people, you travel around this country or around this new beautiful city, you get the new people, it's a honeymoon. So everything's looking cool and, and things work, work great. But actually, uh, it depends very much on the person, but the next thing what happens is a frustration. And I will tell you because we are doing the relocations for the people, uh, for the for the for the industry professionals to 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 the Nordics and Finland. And what actually happens that um, after the honeymoon is over, there comes this period of frustration. I also call this as homesickness. You start to feel that things work so differently. You start to feel that you are an outsider in this new country or in this new city. And uh, it becomes more and more evident that you really want to go back home. This is what happens every time you move, even if you're going to move away from... Today we're in Moscow, I lived in Moscow. You go away for a couple of years, you come back, and you will feel the very same steps. 
So the frustration comes, and that's the part, I think, the, the hardest one. We sp I've seen people that, at that point, when the frustration comes, that things just work differently, and they start to feel like going back home. This is the point where it's a lose-lose situation, both for the company and for the person, when, uh, when, when he or she decides to jump back. But actually, those people that survive this frustration, the next phase is really like acceptance. You start to accept the things that, okay, things just work differently. It doesn't mean that they work wrong or they work right, but they are just working like differently. So you start to feel like accepting that fact, and then you are really feeling the adjustments. You stop judging the way things work in a new environment, and you just accept it and you start to kind of go deeper into that culture and get in the, the understanding. But these are the typical steps, and especially I think it's important for those who decide for the first timers. The first time you decide to relocate, I'm just going to give you that warning. So don't jump, don't, don't go back, don't kind of uh, ruin your plans. If you decided to go somewhere, Please stick a little bit longer. There's going to be the honeymoon period, then there's going to be the, the frustration period and the homesickness, but then there's going to be an acceptance and, and the adjustments. Um, and cultural shock from my, own, uh, from my own experience. Every time you do this move, um, those are two different things, right? The tourism, tourism and immigration. You go to a new country, you spend two weeks in Spain, and you feel like, wow, I'm, I'm in love with this country, I really want to move there. But those are two different things. So th those are the aspects that you need to take into account. It's not always about the weather. It's a lot to do about your also cultural feeling and uh, also a lot to do with what is it that you really want to do professionally. We're now talking about the relocation for the, uh, for the business purposes. Things work differently in different cultures, in different, almost like in different cities. I mean, Russia is the biggest country in the world, and I'm pretty sure that if you move from Moscow to Vladivostok, you're going to feel this the same way. This will just work like differently. Uh, what I would recommend is just give yourself a little bit of time. Don't try to judge. Don't try to make things work the way you are accustomed to, but try to just feel and, 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 and just go with the flow. That, that's, that's, that's my um, advice. Um, and most importantly, get yourself integrated into the new environment. It doesn't matter which country you're going, please try to spend as much time with the locals, try to find these local friends, these local communities, it's gonna help you a lot. It's very obvious, we say do, when in Rome, do as Romans do, but we don't always follow it. What I would like to do is to tell you the survival kit for the first timer. So if I was 15 years back thinking of my first going abroad, what, what I would do for you and for your spouse, if you're alone, it's easier. If you're together, it's harder sometimes, but at the same time. So definitely the language courses, both for you and for your spouse. Try to find it, even if you're not planning to stay and live in this country for longer, please find these language courses. It's gonna help you to find the other people that are in the very same situation like you. They are foreigners as well, they don't always be coming from Russia, but you're gonna find some very good friends and very good connections. Local friends from work, find somebody and, 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 and go to the parties and always say yes to the, any invitations. This way, this cultural shock is gonna go easier. Try to organize a party, invite the locals to your own party, show them the way you party. It's going to make your life easier. Uh, for the spouse, I mean, find the local communities. For instance, my wife, uh, she was looking for this Damaski uh, Finlandi. She found some friends through there. Now they're just going and... Uh, going for the picnics with the kids and things like that. Get a mentor. It's a little bit more difficult, but after leaving if, uh, maybe a year, it, it, it's good. You will get to understand uh, the mentality and um, grow your personal network. Like say yes to anything that comes there. Um, today, we're living in Helsinki, and um, in terms of the cultures, I feel that, for instance, Finland and, and Russia, they've been together and uh, they will always be neighbors. Uh, so I would say that Russians and Finnish like cultures are closer to each other compared to uh, even like a Germany. 
they're both, in terms of the cultures, the way I feel they're very warm-hearted. At the same time, it's going to take time to build the relationship. It's going to take time, so just you, you have to be patient. And um, building trust, of course, is going to take your time plus the effort. And um, the way I like to approach it is keep calm and go to Banya or to sauna in Finland. So that's, that's, that's the way to cope with the cultural differences. In terms of the uh, business culture, that's important. So, um, for instance, um, living and working in Europe for many years and... Uh, I see that in Europe and also in Finland, the experience over education. So people really value your experience and what you can do, not what you have been studying and what kind of diploma you have. So that's important. Very flat organizational structure. So no, like, uh, no, 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 no vertical structure. So the way, for instance, like in our company, we made the decision, we have no CEO. So we are just making these decisions. It actually involves people much more. Um, family time is valuable and respected. I see a lot of young people. We have a kid. So when, once you start getting the kids, you will start to understand that uh, it also takes a lot, a lot of time. And flexible working hours. That's, that's what I like. Uh, and one thing that I learned when I moved uh, actually to Finland was that I worked for a guy who was from the UK, so I spent a lot of time there, and he taught me this one, one lesson. So you're free to make mistakes, and please do make mistakes, but try to avoid mis making the same mistake twice. Um, it's a little bit about the Helsinki, the help, happiest country in the world, and I see my time is, is uh, running out, so I'll try to make it very simple how I chose the city where I live today. So I made a list, I just spent a little bit from my heart, what are the things that would be important for me when I choose the city to live. So for me it was when I was asking myself what would be the fastest way to get from the office home and imagine that it's a bicycle, it's a rollers, this is myself, this is me with my uh, son leaving the, actually the office so I can use the rollers, electric scooters, or auto, tram, or bus. This is actually uh, the fastest way for me to get home is the bicycle. So that was something that I really wanted to have this opportunity. Winter time, summer time, it doesn't matter. So when you make that decision in terms of moving, not the country, but the city, I'm encouraging you Spend some time, ask yourself, what are the things that will be important for you? What would make you feel comfortable and what would make you feel happy? Um, this is uh, my contacts, but um, I also prepared some uh, funny slides just to make this presentation not, not too formal. Uh, this is, uh, I like to make jokes about things. It's, uh, it's a traffic light, you know. You cross the traffic light just to understand these cultural differences. You cross the traffic light and it's raining like hell, you know. You come there and there's no cars and the Finns are just waiting there for the green light to, to cross. That's, that, that is something. Here, you don't need to cross. You see people are just running over, all over the streets. They're so busy, they're so like in a rush. But that's something the, the, the Finns would like fro froze themselves to death but don't cross it. This is, uh, I love, this was a picture actually um, in, the, in the newspaper that I took. It's a French president visit in Finland. And you know Finland um, considered the country that consumes most of the coffee and they really like coffee. I got, maybe got used to it, but uh, then this is a president tasting the Finnish coffee and you can see it from the face that he really doesn't like it. And Finns are thinking that um, this is coffee, is their coffee is the best in the world. Uh, something that, um, in terms of that equality, so for instance, like in Finland, you, you have to be prepared, to, like everyone pays for, for themselves. Um, and then also, like in terms of the Christmas, yeah, really Finnish Christmas, it's just there's nobody on the street. And I feel always uh, very bad for the for the tourists who decide to come to visit, for instance, Finland or Helsinki in the, during the Christmas time because there's nothing, there's nobody there, it's, it's, it's very much. And um, this is a true story. I want to tell you this one story, and it's funny, um, in a way that uh, I worked with a Finn 
and we both worked in London and we were meeting only there during the Nokia time. So his mother is Russian, his father is Finnish. He speaks Russian very, very well with the accent, but he really speaks. So he speaks to his mother in Russian, he, speaks, he spoke English to me. Um, and we are having after work drink, uh, and uh, I tell him that, and, and he starts to that he understands the Russian like mentality and culture. And he has never been to Russia, and I say that you can't understand it because you, haven't, you, you don't really, you haven't been there. And he's, we had a few beers, and then he tells me, okay, I tell him that uh, I'm gonna prove it to you that you don't understand anything about the, the, the Russian culture. So he says, okay, do it. So uh, I tell you, I'm gonna tell you this anecdote, that this uh, Vasily Ivanovich, I'm going to switch to Russian because it's, I think. So, я разговариваю с ним по-русски и говорю ему, что ты никогда не поймешь русскую культуру, потому что ты никогда там не жил. И он, он меня уверяет в другом. Я говорю, хорошо, смотри, вот тебе анекдот. Василий Иван, э, Петька сидит на рельсах, Василий Иванович к нему подходит и говорит, Петька, подвинься. Он начинает улыбаться, я говорю ему, что ты здесь такого смешного? Он говорит, а зачем ему подвигаться, рельсы-то две? Я просто ничего не мог ему сказать. Я просто пять минут я смотрел на него и думал, может быть, я на самом деле что-то не понимаю. But uh, anyway, thank you very much for this presentation, and I'm like, if you have any questions, I'm I'm happy to answer those. These are my contacts if you want to reach me out. Yeah, please ask. Спасибо большое за прекрасный доклад, Олег. Ребят, я думаю. Обязательно должны быть вопросы. Это было очень интересно, и Олег рассказывал о своем опыте. Я думаю, это то, чего хотели бы послушать все. Огромное спасибо за презентацию. Хотел бы спросить, сильно ли ценится все-таки высшее образование за рубежом? Смотрите, это интересный вопрос. Оно ценится, но... Давайте я, может быть, немножко про Европу буду говорить, потому что зарубеж все-таки такой большой. Смотрите, что интересно. Когда я приехал в Финляндию, я поступил туда в университет, был очень этому рад, приехал, учился как мог, потому что это был, наверное, там 2002 или первый год. Мои родители из маленького городка. Мне приходилось работать, учиться. Я просто учился, чтобы его быстрее закончить. Когда я пришел и получил свою первую работу, я поработал там две недели, и ко мне подошел один из как бы, SEO компании, который меня на работу и взял, и сказал, слушай, я на самом деле понял, что у нас здесь 20 человек работает, это была небольшая как бы, компания, и ты единственный человек, у которого есть высшее образование. Поэтому я бы сказал так, люди идут учиться чуть-чуть позже, да, потому что у нас все-таки принято, что после после школы ты обязан поступить, да, там сразу пойти, как бы. И мне кажется, это немножко проблемно, потому что у нас все-таки, если ты не поступил, ты лузер, да, твоя жизнь там потеряна, как бы. И проблема в том, что ты идешь туда, куда ты еще, как бы, у тебя нет еще, наверное, жизненного опыта. И когда я учился, я получал второе образование уже в бизнес-школе, намного позже, я работал, я уже четко понимал, куда я хочу развиваться. И когда я учился там с людьми, которые тоже были постарше, я был очень сильно удивлен тому, что многие из них получали только первое как бы, образование. Поэтому, да, оно ценится, безусловно, для, для, наверное, для нас, для нас, как иностранцев там, да, то есть это будет необходимостью, но это не, не обязательное, скажем так, условие. То есть сегодня я могу вам сказать, что у нас было два клиента, которые очень хотели себе специалистов из России, нашли здесь, и у них обоих не было высшего образования не было законченного высшего образования. Здравствуйте, спасибо за доклад, было очень интересно послушать. У меня вот такой своеобразный вопрос интересный. Вот в России у нас да, исторически сложилось очень много праздников. Мы очень часто отдыхаем. Отдыхаем на Майске, отдыхаем там. За рубежом по-другому. Как вот это вот в первые годы, там, в первое время воспринимается... Легко ли люди переходят, отказываются от отдыхов, к которым они там годами, десятилетиями привыкали? Есть ли там какая-то проблема или нет, или это все легко воспринимается? 
Спасибо. Я думаю, это воспринимается очень легко. Не думаю, что… То есть там будут другие праздники, они будут отличаться, наверное, от тех, которых как бы привыкли и мы. Но будут и свои, как бы достаточно прикольные. То есть немножко по-другому. Смотрите, я вам такой даже приведу пример, вот как я вижу. Да, у нас Новый год — это, наверное, праздник номер один. Да, такой, то есть большой, там, с друзьями, длинный и так далее. В Европе тоже отмечают Новый год, да, но поскольку у них Рождество проходит до… Да, то вот эти все вечеринки, которые мы закладываем, они происходят вообще в течение вот декабря. То есть в течение декабря э, каждая компания, каждый человек пытается устроить и провести у себя на выходных. То есть декабрь для них это всегда такой как бы… Ну, может быть, больше там для финнов как бы это называется такой little Christmas, да, то есть такой, когда каждые выходные буквально либо компания, либо свои друзья проводят эти как бы вечеринки. То есть они их тоже отмечают, но просто не, может быть не в таком объеме, как у нас там в, в, там, в неделю это там вложиться и всех увидеть. Но в целом как бы нет, там они будут просто другие, скажем так, и по-другому отмечаться, но… Но мои друзья, смотрите, иностранцы, я когда с ними познакомился, уже в бизнес-школе вернулся когда, то, например, я, они традиционно они до сих пор понят, я устраивал им эти Russian вечеринки, я покупал в Duty Free, это, и даже в, в Финляндии алкоголь продается только в, в специализированных, там это как бы монополия, но там продается этот русский стандарт, как бы они все запомнили, как пить водку, как это должны быть что такое пельмени и так далее. То есть я как-то смог им показать, как мы это отмечаем, и они это очень хорошо запомнили. Раз, раз. Здравствуйте, спасибо за лекцию. Вот мне всегда казалось, что работу в разы проще найти, когда ты уже на месте. А у вас-то получается, это поиск удаленный изначально получается, и как бы даже… То есть всегда встречаешься с работодателем потом лично или получается, что можно вообще найти работу полностью удаленно, приехать и вот уже как? Ну смотрите, нет. Я думаю, что вы можете быть классным специалистом, вам может не подойти компания или компании вы не можете не подойти как бы по культурным аспектам. Да, мы делаем так, что мы проводим интервью, мы тестируем английский как бы язык, то есть обычные тестовые как бы задания. Но если компания уже заинтересована, мы, как правило, проводим один или два таких онсайт интервью, когда человек приезжает и просто посмотрит как бы на компанию то есть и потом принимается как бы обоюдное решение потому что в этом случае это всегда как бы проблема мы наверное со своей стороны тоже хотим у нас вообще модель смотрите какая мы называемся games factory talents потому что мы пошли от этой идеи как бы от talents да, в рекрутинге несмотря на то что все равно за успешные как бы закрытую позицию компании платят нам средства но мы берем мы предложили им такую модель, да, что если человек, когда он приходит и начинает работать, мы получаем эту комиссию намного попозже. То есть наша задача найти, если вы будете счаст, ну, счастливы, я не знаю, если вы будете удовлетворены да, в этой компании, мы видим, что может быть она вам не подойдет, то мы скорее всего предложим вам что-то другое, скажем так. Но в ответе на ваш вопрос я скажу, что мы всегда привозим сотрудников посмотреть, посмотреть на офис, познакомиться как бы лично, потому что людям потом придется работать как бы каждый день в офисе. Мне кажется, тут должен быть какой-то такой фит обязательно. То есть это слишком рискованно, я бы так сказал. И для компании, ну и для вас принять офер без, без посещения компании.